Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Greetings, friends. This is Charles Jennings with Truth in History Ministries. Today we would like to be talking about something that is not very seldom mentioned. It's mentioned um, quite often, I guess, in sermons, but we have never figured out or I've never heard the reason why. And that is concerning the ministry of Jonah. Jonah was a Hebrew prophet, but yet he went to a non-covenant, non-Hebrew people. And that's what we want to be talking about today. Why did God send Jonah to a non-covenant people? I have made a chart that it's impossible to put on the screen. It's a large chart, as you can see. It's very large, but it contains the outline, a timeline of some of the Old Testament history, especially recorded in the book of Kings and Chronicles, concerning the deportations, the invasions, and the captivities of Assyria into northern Israel and even into southern Judah. But we see this laid out in the Old Testament, and we see where Jonah is part of that history. But what was the reason why God was so insistent on Jonah going to Nineveh? Now, first of all, I want to uh, go way back into the Old Testament in the book of Genesis and find out who were these people that inhabited the land of Assyria and Nineveh. Now, when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, it was not the capital of Assyria at the time, but the capital of the city of the, of the country at that time was named Asher. And you'll see a, a reason why here in a minute. In Genesis chapter 10, and in verse number 6 and following. Now, we know that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem was the father of the Hebrews, Abrahamic line, but Ham was that son that probably a renegade, and, you know, he, he defiled his father's bed. Uh, so, therefore, brought forth a son by the name of Canaan. And Canaan had several children, and they became known as Canaanites. But this is not the line of the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrian Empire actually didn't start out as an empire, of course, but it started out as a city, uh, just a family, really. So, therefore, they named this city and these people after their progenitor, after their you know, great-great-grandfather, so to speak. And that was typical in those days. Now, in Genesis chapter 10, in verse number 6, it says this, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, we know that Canaan was the father of the Canaanites. Mizraim, his people went down and established Egypt. And then there 
was Cush. And in verse number seven, it says, And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabtaka, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Some scholars have interpreted that phrase, mighty hunter before the Lord, as a mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord. Verse 10, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kauni, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher. Now Nimrod started the kingdom of Babel, or Babel, or later known as Babylon. And then we have Asher coming out of that land, came forth Asher, A-S-S-H-U-R. And he builded another city, and that city was called Nineveh. And the city Rehoboth and Kela. Now, Nineveh, or the Assyrian Empire, as it later became an empire, was located uh, right next to the Tigris River. And that's going to be a, a, that's going to play a big part in what we see later on in this story. So we see where Asher is the father of the Assyrians or of that what later became an empire. So Nineveh was built by Asher, but it was not the capital city at the time that Jonah went there several hundred years later. Some people have equated Nimrod with Sargon, King Sargon whether that be correct or not, but we know that Nineveh, or not Nineveh, but we know that Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Apparently, he was a man that had a lot of influence over a lot of people. And therefore, he could uh, build a city. He could, you know, start a following, and whatever he said, that's what went. And then there was, was there a split? Um, did, did Asher say, hey, I'm leaving Babylon and I'm going to go build my own city? So apparently uh, it was the time of development, world development, and, you know, these sons were separating from one another and so forth. So the Assyrians are from Ham, and from the son of Ham, the Cushites. So the Assyrians were Cushites. They were not Shemites. They were not Hebrews. They were Cushites. Now, Jonah's ministry, now, let me back up just a little. The account that I just read in Genesis chapter 10, started approximately 2500 B.C. Some say 2300 to 2500 B.C. But Jonah's ministry came 1500 years later, at least 1500 years later. By that time, Assyria was a world empire. In fact, it was the biggest world empire at the time. It was greater than Babylon. And 
The Assyrians were brutal. You could look up on YouTube, um, someone has posted the history of the Assyrian Empire. It's called the Assyrians Empire of Iron. And that is from a secular standpoint describing what these people were like, what the kingdom was like. And they were a brutal people. They were vicious. And one of their tactics is they went out to all the other smaller countries and empires and kingdoms around there, and they would conquer them. And one of their tactic, tactics was not only invasion, captivity, but the deportation of the people. The, the people were taken up by the army and deported out of their land and taken back to the land or the empire of Assyria. They were a bloody people. They were vicious. So in approximately 782 to 753, I'm going to give you several dates in this, in this lesson. In approximately 782 to 753 BC was Jonah's ministry to Nineveh. Now, Jonah himself was of the tribe of Zebulun. And we see in 2 Kings chapter 14, 2 Kings 14, we see 2 Kings 14. Let me turn this page. In verse number 23, this is talking about the reign of Jeroboam II. That is the king of Israel. He was the 14th king of Israel. And in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebath, who, was, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. So Jonah was a prophet during the days of King Jeroboam II, the 14th king of Israel. It said, by the hand of, the, of his servant Jonah, the son of Amity, the prophet, which was of Gath, Gath Hefer. So Jonah was a known prophet during the reign of Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, but Jeroboam the second. So therefore, the Lord chose him to go to Nineveh. And when we go to the book of Nineveh, we see where the Lord sent such a mighty spiritual awakening to that city that the people repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, we all know the story. I'm not going to go through the whole story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was reluctant to go. And Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord sent Jonah to Nineveh, but he rose up, took a ship going somewhere else. Did Jonah, let's, let's be practical about this. Jonah knew the reputation, the vicious reputation of the Assyrian Empire. It was, it was known throughout the world. 
because they had brutalized whole nations and other kingdoms. So Jonah probably says to himself, why do I want to go there? They will just kill me. They'll do away with me. They're vicious. And besides, they're a non-covenant people. But the Lord sent a great wind and a storm arose on the sea. And Jonah was asleep in the boat. And the people went to him and said, O sleeper, arise and call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And the Lord prepared a great fish because they threw him overboard. He knew that he was the problem. Jonah knew that he was the reason why God sent that storm. And he said, throw me overboard. And the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And he was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. I take it to be 72 hours, three days and three nights. So Jonah is in the belly of this big fish, and he prayed, Lord, get me out of this place. He said, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Well, he finally submitted, and he said in verse number 9 of chapter 2, Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah out. And the word of the Lord came to him in chapter number 3, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Well, he goes to Nineveh, he entered the city, and he cried, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God. This is chapter 3, verse 5. And proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. The city, the empire, proclaimed a day of repentance, or maybe several days of repentance. And sackcloth sat in sackcloth and ashes. And the king caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. They went on a fast. Apparently, the Spirit of God was in the words of Jonah and transformed transformed the heart of the king. But it, but it goes on to say, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, man and beast, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Well, this beast was probably a beast man because there's no violence in the hands of the four-legged beast, but that's a different story. So, Jonah leaves the city, and he's disappointed that God did not destroy the city. And the Lord prepared a gourd, chapter 4, verse 6, that it may shadow over Jonah's head. And he was glad, but God prepared a worm when the morning 
rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat down upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted and wished to himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. The Lord prepared, this is how insistent the Lord dealt with Jonah. God prepared a wind, a fish, a gourd, a worm, and an east wind. This was a serious calling to a heathen, non-covenant empire and people. But why? That's what we want to know is why. Okay, the people repented. Now, that was approximately 782 to 753 B.C. Then the first Assyrian invasion is recorded. I'm not going to read all these scriptures, but it's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 15, 19 to 20. And the Assyrian king's name was Pul, P-U-L. And he exacted silver as a tribute from Israel, God's covenant people. And then in 745, there was a second Assyrian invasion into northern Israel. And this king was named Tiglath-Pileser III. And that's recorded in 2 Kings 15, 29. And the Israel king was named Pekah. And it says that Israel was lightly afflicted. He took eight cities captive to Assyria. That was their tactic. Go in, capture a city, take the people, the ones that they wanted, and take them back to Assyria. Then the third Assyrian invasion, also by Tiglath-Pileser, and this was because Assyria defeated Syria, Assyria defeated Syria, in order to rescue Ahaz, king of Judah. So that was another invasion. That's found in 2 Kings 16, 9. Then there was a fourth invasion in 727 B.C. And that was, that Assyrian king's name was Shalmaneser V. That's recorded in 2 Kings 17, 1 to 3. And he exacted gifts and King Hoshea, that is the Israel king, became his servant. Now the fifth Assyrian invasion into northern Israel was made by Shalmaneser V again. And the Israel king was Hosea. And that's recorded in 2 Kings 17.4. And he put King Hoshea or Hoshea, however you want to pronounce it, he imprisoned him, and he besieged the city of Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel, for three long years. Now, there was a sixth invasion, and that was by Shalmaneser V. And that's recorded in 2 Kings 17, 5 to 6. And he deported Israelites to Hala, Habor, by the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. I hope you're following me on this. I'm imposing on your knowledge of Old Testament history because we can't read all of this. We'd be here for two hours. But there were several invasions by the Assyrian 
Empire into northern Israel between 745 B.C. and 721 B.C. So now we are at the seventh Assyrian invasion. This is 721 B.C. So there's seven invasions of this mighty empire into the land of northern Israel. And here again, he deported Israelites to Hala, Habor, by the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. That's up in the, uh, what we now call Iraq, Iran, uh, along the Tigris River. And then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, in 701, he did not invade northern Israel. He went to southern Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And this is when Nineveh became the capital city. In 705 B.C., Nineveh became the capital city. And the king of Judah was Hezekiah at the time. So Sennacherib, this arrogant, mighty, powerful king, he came and he invaded southern Judah. But he went to the fence cities around Jerusalem. He did not attack Jerusalem at this time. So he, departed, he deported Judahites and Benjamites, people of the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, into Assyria, but he did not touch Jerusalem. But he came back later thinking that he can control the city of Jerusalem, conquer the city of Jerusalem. So he threatens the city of Jerusalem. This is Sennacherib. King Hezekiah is, is still the king of Judah. And that's when the Lord sent an angel, a mighty angel, and slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And this is recorded in 2 Kings 19, 1 to 37. Well, the prophet Zephaniah, I'm going to turn to the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah proclaims, he stood up and he declared that the Lord is going to overthrow the Assyrian Empire. In Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse number 13. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. He didn't say the city of Asher. Why is it that he said Nineveh? because Nineveh had been now made the capital city of Assyria under King Sennacherib. So he's crying against the empire, the very heart and the capital of the empire of Assyria, and says, I'm going to lay you waste and flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, and he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me, proud. That's an expression 
of their arrogant, proud attitude. I am the greatest. I am untouchable. I'm the best. I'm the strongest, etc. But God is able to bring them down. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passeth by shall hiss and wag his hand. Now, in that YouTube video, The Assyrians, Empire of Iron, it gives the, from a secular standpoint, the history of the empire and its overthrow. And also it talks about how desolate the land became so that even people many years later were asked, who lived here? And they said, I don't know. We, we don't know. In other words, just God just put them out into oblivion, out of the remembrance of people. And it was God's judgment because of their brutality of other nations. Now, um, that was Zephaniah's prophecy. And then 663 to 612 B.C. was Nahum's prophecy. And Nahum was from Galilee. Nahum was from Galilee. And he declared the overthrow of the Assyrian Empire. He declared the overthrow of the Assyrian Empire. Now let's go to the book of Jonah. Now I'm not going to read the whole book of Jonah or Nahum, excuse me. I'm not going to read the whole book of, of Nahum, but this is what it says. Nahum starts out and he declares in first, the first part of chapter 1 the sovereignty of God. That's what he declares in chapter 1. So the prophet Nahum is declaring the fact that whatever God does, He's just. This is what He says in verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in mercy and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind, in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. You see, the Lord is declaring his sovereignty, his holiness, his wisdom, his fairness, that however he treats nations, that's his business. He knows what he's doing. And then we come to chapter 2 in the book of Nahum. Verse number 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Talking about the Assyrian Empire. And then it talks about the battle in the streets of Nineveh. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall joshua 
one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. Now, what does all that mean? When the Assyrian Empire was attacked, you see, here's Assyria over here. It's the mighty one. It's the empire, greatest empire of the world at that time. Here's Babylon. But Assyria began to weaken, and Babylon began to get stronger. So as Babylon became stronger, they allied with the Medes, M-E-D-E-S. They allied with the Medes, and they said, we are going to destroy the Assyrian Empire because they have brutalized us for decades. They have brutalized Egypt. They have gone throughout that whole region of the world, and they have been cruel to all their people that they have attacked because they would not only uh, brutalize the soldiers, they would brutalize the citizens of wherever they went. So when Babylon and the Medes teamed up together and they attacked Assyria, this is a description, verses 1 through 5, or basically 3 through 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the prophet is describing the destruction of the city of Nineveh. He is not talking about modern America with all the cars in the streets with headlights. That's what we have been told. No, this is a, uh, a description of the overthrow of that city. It said, the shield of the mighty men. That's the warriors of Babylon. The Lord destroyed Nineveh by the following means. The invading army of Babylon and the Medes. Number two, with the sword, they came in and began to swing their swords. And that talks about that's referred to as the shield of his mighty men is now red. They're bleeding. They're dying in the streets. Also, Babylon started fires in the city. That's number three. Number four, by water. Now, it says in verse number six, the gates of the rivers shall be open. Nineveh was built right on, right next to the Tigris River. It had rained and rained and rained, and the Tigris had flooded. And when it flooded, they had gates. The Assyrians had built gates. The engineers had built gates to, and walls to protect the city against flooding. But the Babylonians opened the gates and let the water come in. So they flooded the city. So there was a flood. There was fire. There were soldiers swinging their swords and killing the Assyrian people and the Assyrian soldiers. This is the description. Now, you know, a lot of people have said the chariots shall rage in the streets. That's all the cars in America, you know, running into one another. That has nothing to do with modern America or any other modern country or cars. This is talking about the invasion of Babylon into Assyria. 
Now, when here, here's, here's the crux of the matter. Assyria had made all these invasions from 745 B.C. to 721 B.C. into northern Israel and taken all the Israelites into Assyria. Up by, check it out on your map, to Hala, Habor, and by the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. And then they went down and took Judahites and Benjamites out of the cities surrounding Jerusalem. Now you have all 12 tribes represented in the Assyrian captivities. All 12 tribes. Actually, 13 tribes because the tribe of Joseph was a dual tribe, Ephraim and Manasseh. So they're up there. The city is being destroyed. The empire is now under siege from Babylon. Things are looking bad. The empire is weakening. And guess what? Their powerful king, whose name was Asher Banipal, died. He died in 630 B.C. So what did those Israelites do? This was their chance to leave. This was their chance to leave when the kingdom was in a weakened state, when they could no longer hold the Israelites captive. Where did the Israelites go? Now, I wish I had a big map here to show you that where the Assyrian Empire was. So the Israelites left and they went across the Caucasus Mountains, traveling into northwestern Europe. Something had to happen to them. Now, the big question is, why did God send a Hebrew prophet to preach to a non-covenant people? He sent that prophet approximately 165 years before the destruction of the city that was declared by the prophet Nahum. Jonah was 165 years before Nahum. He sent a revival to give them, give those people, a sense of morality, of fairness, compatibility with the Israelites, because there's no record that the Assyrians brutalized or killed the Israelites. There's no, there's no indication of that. So they were existing in safety, but they were captives. And the Lord prepared the hearts of these people so that influence of righteousness would be in existence during the time of the captivities that sense of fairness that came from the righteousness of the Hebrew God and the law of Moses, even though they were Cushites, they were distant cousins of the Israelites, very distant. But it made that land more compatible for the Israelites to live there. That's why God sent a prophet 
and a spiritual revival to a non-covenant people because he knew, the Lord knew that Assyria would capture his people and hold them there approximately a hundred years. The Israelites were in Assyria approximately a hundred years when the kingdom began to, to wane and to weaken, and they left. There is no record that they went back to Palestine. There is no biblical record. There is no secular record. There's only one reference that the, uh, one priest went back and his family. But the bulk of the Israelites crossed the Caucasus Mountains and they were gone. They were in northwestern Europe, traveling in that direction for several hundred years and finally established the ten Gothic nations. Now, the big question, why did God send a Hebrew prophet to preach to a non-covenant people? Through the prophet Jonah, the Lord sent a spiritual revival to Nineveh in prior preparation for the arrival of the Israelites. This is the sovereignty of God, folks. In the book of Exodus, it says that the Lord carried Israel as on eagle's wings. In other words, He's going to care for them. And regardless whether the fact being that they were captives, He is still carrying them because He swore by Himself in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 33, he gave a sevenfold witness that he would swear, promise, guarantee that Israel shall always be a people. And those witnesses were sun, moon, stars, day, night, heaven, and earth. Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 33, it's there. So regardless of the captivity, regardless of the bondage that they were in, God swear they're going to remain a people. They didn't just fade away like some theologians say and was blended in with all the other nations around them and just went into oblivion. That's what they teach. And it, those that teach that are going directly against the Word of God. Okay, the Lord sent a revival in prior preparation for the arrival of the Israelites. There were seven Assyrian captivities, invasions into northern Israel between 745 and 721 B.C., and one into southern Judah. After King Ashurbanipal's death in 630 B.C., the Assyrian Empire weakened and the Israelites continued their trek to northwestern Europe. That's why God sent a revival to Nineveh. He didn't send a revival to Babylon or those other heathen nations around them. He sent that spiritual revival in preparation for the arrival of the Israelites. And they left after a hundred years when the kingdom weakened. and They crossed the Caucasus Mountains into northwestern Europe. And eventually, when Jesus came, you know, the, the prophecy given by Moses 
the prophecy given by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, this is what it says. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. In other words, the prophecy was given to the Israelites. I'm going to send you a Savior. I'm going to send you a prophet, and you will listen. Have the Jews accepted Jesus Christ as their national God? You can answer that for yourself. Who has, what people on the earth has accepted Jesus Christ? Has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and their national God for centuries, and Northwestern Europe itself became known as Christendom. Where was the great Protestant revival at? Well, in fulfillment of that prophecy that came through Moses, we turn to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, chapter number 3, Peter is preaching, and he says, in verse number 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, or prophesied should come, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. You see, Moses prophesied it. Peter verified it, the fulfillment of that prophecy, and said, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to be that prophet, your Savior, your God, and the Israelites are destined and prophesied and predestined to accept Him as Savior. And what other people on the earth has done that? The Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian people have accepted Him, generally speaking, and throughout European history, it was Christendom, the kingdom of Christ, and the great Protestant Reformation, and the great preachers and great revivals that have taken place in Europe, in North America. God preserved the Israel people in Assyria. God preserved the, uh, the, the people of Israel in Assyria because He had destined them to remain a people before Him and swear by those seven witnesses in the heavens that Israel shall remain a people. And when they came across those Caucasus mountains, settled the ten Gothic nations, and became what we are today, Christianity and the Word of God came to us, and our people accepted it. Moses' prophecy, Peter's word of fulfillment. Thank God that we can see the faithfulness of God Himself. Now, I want to say this before I close. In the book of Nahum, we see We see a phrase. We see a phrase in this, in this book. Nahum 3.1, Woe to the bloody city. It is 
all full of lies and robbery, the prey departeth not. That is speaking about the viciousness, the atrocities that took place during the empire of Assyria against the people that they captured, the atrocities. And God is going to judge that. We say, yeah, but that's a non-covenant people. God is the God of nations. He keeps record on all nations, not just covenant nations. And the brutality, look at the brutality and the viciousness that has gone on in nations just within the last 100 years. In the Soviet Union, read the books concerning the history of the reign of Stalin. God is going to judge iniquity on every level. And he keeps accurate records. So, folks, it's good to be within the ark of safety. And that ark of safety is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So, if you're not right with God, I say repent. Accept Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Change your wicked ways. There's hope, but only in the Christ of Calvary. There's hope only in the Christ of Calvary. God bless every one of you. May you see a greater, uh, a greater God than you saw before in His control of history, in His control of history, in protecting His people Israel, because He has a plan, and He's coming back to rule over the house of of Jacob forever, and going to sit on the throne of his father, David. God bless everyone.